let someone get those doors. All right, well, thanks for attending this discussion. Time to grow up, advertising and mobile marketing in the cannabis industry. I am your host, Aaron Silverman, moderating this panel of awesome experts. For those of you who don't know me, I've been in the cannabis space for a little over 13 years. I've been involved with everything from manufacturing to consulting, speaking around the country, teaching classes, helping open up retail operations, and I'm also the proud president and co-founder of Media Gel, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a little bit. But let me get to some introductions with my uh, panel. Uh, joining us here, Chris Day from MJ Biz Daily. Um, very excited to have you on this panel. Let me tell you a little bit about Chris. He's a senior marketing director at MJ Biz Daily. He leads the strategic vision behind MJ Biz Daily and MJ BizCon's marketing and competitive positioning. His, oh, that was loud. His 20 plus year, uh, year career designed designing experimental events, advertising, PR, and promotions at agencies, and he has his own marketing firm, which has spanned a wide variety of high growth and high impact industries. So thanks for being here, Chris, I appreciate it, yeah. Cynthia Salary Zada, is that right? Good enough, all right. She has more than 15 years of seasoned PR experience and strategic communications and expertise. She's a managing partner at KCSA Strategic Communications. Prior to joining KCSA, Cynthia was the founder and CEO of a leading uh, cannabis public relations firm, Solar Media Group, which KCSA acquired. Congrats on that. Those are great to see and happen in the space. She's worked with the companies such as Humboldt's Finest, Frontera, and Julian Marley's Juju Royale brand, to name just a few of them. And her cannabis clients have been featured in Forbes, Fortune, The New Yorker, Bloomberg, Inc., and a host of other, and a host of other leading publications. I've heard of all those. Those are great. Yeah. Next up, my boy Gary Allen with over 15 years of experience in the mobile platform space. Oh, this is Jake, why did this? Oh, we got Jake here, okay, the wrong picture, okay. My other boy down there, Jake, with over 15 years of experience in the mobile platform space. Jake is the CEO, yeah, I did, I did you a favor for a moment. Yeah, he's the CEO of, and uh, my co-founding partner of Media Gel, which is a mobile ad agency that connects brands with today's on-the-go consumers, leveraging location-based technology and behavioral science providing state-of-the-art geospatial intelligence. So Jake will make more sense of that for you later on in the uh, presentation. Now, Gary, a visionary thought leader in the tech space. He's well known for his accomplishments in marketing and technology. Some of Gary's successes include the creation of the market's first mobile banking app in 1998. Yeah. Gary heads up operations for New Frontier Data as their COO and lead character. <laughs> Christian, glad to have you on this panel as a fellow Aztec. Go Aztecs. Go Aztecs. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Aztec pride right there. <laughs> I love that. Christian's a leading executive in the programmatic advertising industry. He's a founder and CEO of Traffic Roots, uh, which is a digital ad network that's bringing digital advertising to the cannabis space. Christian brings leading industry ad network experience and methodologies to help with cannabis brands and publications expand their digital marketing needs. So, without further ado, we're going to get moving. We're going to talk about a lot of numbers. There's going to be a lot of stats, a lot of data, a lot of important stuff. So, I'm going to give it to you, and then we're going to make sense of it at the end. If you have any questions, you'll have a chance to answer, uh, ask me any of them or ask them any of them. So, today, let's see, are we on the right slide? Perfect. 95% of Americans own a mobile device. It's probably, you know, today we're going to talk with you about some of that and why that matters. 77% of them have smartphones. Yeah, a little closer. Is that better? Oh, good. Perfect. All right. Uh, yeah, there we go. 77% of which have smartphones. Three and a half billion of them are mobile internet users. Driving 80% of global internet usage. We have one in 10 Americans that are smart, that use smartphones only for the internet. That's pretty interesting. We'll get to that. 88% of those consumers use their smartphones to search for local businesses. Maybe not a surprise, but that's a pretty good high number. 50% of which will actually visit that local business after they visit it uh, on their phone. And 57% of these customers want loyalty programs. While 56% of the customers want coupon offers. Four times as many of those consumers actually want to watch a video. And 50% of those consumers are likely to read emails that include videos. So if you're wondering whether or not video makes a difference, well, there you go, it does. One in four of those consumers lose interest if a company does not have a video, so I guess if you put a video out, that's probably a 75% chance if you're doing the math that they're going to be more interested in it. That's Aztec math right there. You know what I mean? Like he's <laughs> well, it's Harvard of the West. You know, I don't have to throw it out there so much. 
Four and five consumers say a video showing a product or service is important. And 90% of the text messages are read in three seconds. 29% of those are targeted with SMS ads that they respond. And 47% of those respond, uh, responded went on to make a purchase, which that's really important when we start talking about click-through and stuff later on. 48% of the users searching for the internet use their mobile devices. And 80% of those Americans that carry a cell phone carry them everywhere they go. I'd even argue that's a higher number. You ask them, based on my kids, I guess. 75% of these smartphone users take them into the bathroom. By 2019, nearly 72% of marketing dollars will be spent on mobile ads. That's great. <laughs> I love seeing that number. 18% of the people that are exposed to mobile ads click on them. So let's move through and get to our panel for a little bit of discussion. And at this point, oop, let me start here. Let's go first with Jake Litke. Hey, Jake, can you talk about the convergence of advertising, mobility, and how geotargeting can impact the cannabis industry? Sure. Hello? Yeah, that works. Yeah. Yeah. Just real easy stuff, yeah. These, were, these, weren't, these balls, weren't free balls, tickets, yeah. No. These weren't free tickets. All right. <laughs> um, well, if you're going to do, uh, if you use programmatic ad buying, um, you can use geospatial audiences to circumvent the restrictions that you run into with Facebook and Google. So by figuring out where your customers have been, um, you can then target them in, on the programmatic exchange without running into the same issues. Christian actually probably has a... Has you want to add anything to that, Christian? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so one of the big things is mobile, obviously, but on the programmatic side, what people... Programmatic, what that means, it's like real-time analytics, real-time targeting, real-time pretty much everything from an advertising perspective. So from a targeting, talking about cannabis brands, you could be so defined on who you want your ad to see. You know, if your product is in Colorado, you can go from the state to the county to the zip to the city, whatever you want. And the important behind that is understanding the data that it's providing. And by understanding the data, you can actually take that data and say, okay, well, in Colorado, all the users that I'm advertising to are on iOS, on Apple devices, or a good percentage of them. So then you can tailor your advertising based on the data feed that you get back from the results of programmatic. Great, well, awesome, thanks for weighing in on that. Cynthia. You ready? What types of obstacles do cannabis brands face with advertising and marketing, and what are some of the ways to get around this? So cannabis brands face all types of obstacles. Uh, a few years ago, advertising for cannabis was almost non-existent. Uh, now we see you know, a much broader framework for options, but <coughs> when you do move into that space, what we are allowed to do is is heavily restricted within that framework. So ways around it would be to expand your digital footprint through newsletters, mobile marketing, um, content marketing, SEO, and I would engage professional public relations, marketing, and digital advertising agencies who specifically navigate the landscape. In cannabis, that's, your, that's the best way to do it is to just go grab the professionals who literally have figured it all out and get creative. Yeah, awesome. Anybody want to add to that? Jake? Is there anybody that's figured it all out? I believe me and my team have. <laughs> Jake, you want to add to that? Yeah, you got that mic? that you can, you can do is there's, you, you can advertise cannabis brands today on mainstream publications. When I say publications, that could be an application or a website on your phone. Um, there are uh, mainstream publications today that if you went to them and tried to run a cannabis campaign directly with them, they would turn you down. But if you follow some reasonable creative guidelines uh, and you buy them through the exchange, they're more than happy to take your money. Yeah, yeah so yeah, that's the are. Chris, got a mic? Can you talk to us about your thoughts on how companies are using historical data to maximize their spend? That's not a hop at all from where we just were. Um, <laughs> the, first of all, hi, everybody. How are we doing? Have you noticed how like, obtrusive these cameras are? It makes me nervous as hell. <laughs> That's all right. 
Um, so we're talking about data, right? <laughs> data optimization. Absolutely. Using that for, um, I think, for MJ Biz, um, we've been able to track data now back since the origination of the company, and start using predictive analysis to figure out like what audiences are most likely to be interested, for example, in certain tracks at our shows. Um, who's most likely to pay money for a subscription with a certain topic. Um, and I think that extrapolates out pretty well for um, everybody, whether you're in a B2B channel or a B2C product, because we've been around long enough now to take both mainstream consumer packaged goods data and behavioral analysis and apply that to almost every geographic sector that exists, and then as everybody else has been talking about, pick the channel that is most effective to apply that data to. Um, we've been playing a lot with uh, Google Ad Buys lately because we've seen some loosening of um, Google's restrictions and some of the social platforms. They regress periodically, so you have to then wait. But um, combining all of that has been intriguing to see and you know retargeting campaigns using that data um, I've been able to generate some pretty cool positive ROI um, just optimizing numbers it's not sexy really um, yeah. when you think about how people can look at advertising but if I can change two words in a copy line and based on predictive analysis drive an increase of 30% on my ROI, I win. So, it works. You yeah. just gotta do it. That was a great answer. Thanks, Chris. Gary, can you talk to us a little bit about data and the unique opportunity that exists in the cannabis industry, since you are the, uh, one of the leaders in data? Sure, can I uh, really quickly ask a question? How many people in the room are actually either currently advertisers or thinking about advertising their products? Great. How many of you have successfully launched a mobile campaign to do that? About half. Not even third. Okay, cool. That way we know kind of who we're talking See? to. See, gathering data. He's always gathering data. Always no gathering matter what, data. he's always gathering data. <laughs> Isn't da data? <clears throat> data, especially, especially in advertising and marketing, right? So we're really talking about marketing, right? The, the data and marketing in this industry is really important for a couple of things. Well, we just talked about MJ Biz using historical data to understand the, the consumer journey, right? How many people, when, when they engage, how they engage, and how to continually repeat successful engagement. Uh, you know, um, Jake and, and Christian were talking about, you know, how to target, how to make sure that you understand the audience you're getting to and where you're getting to them. And that's really, the data is really important for a number of reasons. First and foremost, you always want to be able to increase and repeat, right, positive performance. Second is, while we may be cannabis marketers today in this room, tomorrow there are going to be mature marketing companies that want to market to our consumers and they want to buy your, your products that you're trying to market to those consumers. And we have to find a way to be, and mobile is one of those ways, to be able to protect the mature brands against, uh, against you know, uh, breaking regulations or somehow making their, you know, exposing their brands to illegality. So data is all around that, and it's really important that we understand not only how marketing performs, but how it also protects as we, as we build out the marketplace. Christian, you're up. Digital ad networks are a common place throughout the rest of the online retail world. How has the cannabis industry been quick to adopt this commonly used tool? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's <laughs> all right. A little joke late in the uh, afternoon, right? Wake people up. Um, <laughs> I mean, Jake will probably know. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of ad networks outside of cannabis. And this is how normal companies buy media, whether it's content, paid content, native advertising, mobile advertising, banners, video, I mean, you name it. Um, and I, I think a lot of those guys aren't getting in the game 100% because it's still federally legal. And although some of the regulations are still kind of softening up, it's, um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to express to people that if 
you, get, you can't do it through Google and you can't do it through Facebook, you, there's other ways you can do it. There's other ways you can manage it as well. Um, and it's finding those outlets, as some of us have said, and test, test, and test some more. That's, that's the name of the game. I think the definition of advertising, especially in the digital world, is you have to be a graphic designer, you have to be uh, a, uh, like a statistics expert, you have to be a business developer, and then once you make it all into the mix, then you become a digital marketer. Um, and, and understand the psychology behind those ads and what the audience is will give you the upper hand on how to be able to target effectively and some of those tweaks that you mentioned as well. Um, it could be text, and you change the text, then it gives you better ROI. You can always test different ads. I always encourage people to like, Test different ads, different pictures, same message. And then benchmark them to see which one's doing better and kick the ones that are not doing better and then hit them again. So on, on, on the cannabis side, I think we, we have a long ways to go, but I think we're on the right track. Jake, we've talked in the past about how you know, nascent the cannabis industry is when it comes to advertising and that's somewhat uh, been inspiring to you to kind of come out with some services and introduce tools and some advanced ad tech to the space. Can you just expand a little bit about what Christian was talking about when it comes to tools? that are needed in the, in the cannabis space? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of tools in advertising that people have been using for and, and developing. Um, and some of those are just really now being able to be used in cannabis. Um, and I actually want to touch on something Christian said specifically with the testing. You need to be willing to invest in your brand and your advertising. Um, if you, you can't spend $500 and expect anything to happen really because you need to you need to run 10 different creatives, you need to run five different audiences, you need to test different geographies, um, and that's gonna cost thousands of dollars before you start to see an actual return on investment. So that's another thing that we've found with new brands that, that come to us and they wanna start what you could normally do on Facebook or Google, you could put $500 in a campaign. If you put $500 into a programmatic ad buy, you're basically just gonna throw it away because all of the, the beginning of your campaign um, is about learning what works. That's a great point. Yeah, trying to you know build a brand, if you will, without using some of these techniques and technologies is like trying to make friends without a personality. And when it comes to the business, it's important to understand that because that's how that's how important this is in this space. And while it's not something that we're all really familiar with as an industry yet, um, we need to get really familiar with it. We need to get familiar with it real soon because as these things loosen up and lighten up, the opportunity to build your brand will never be cheaper than it is right now. Um, period. So every day, every hour, every opportunity, it will get more expensive and more difficult to do. There will be less affordable inventory available and you'll be spending a whole lot more money doing things that you had an opportunity to do early on. And a lot of that optimization that they're talking about between, you know, s small multiple spends and different geographies and different audience and different creatives, that's how you figure out what works and what doesn't on a very inexpensive level so that once you figure it out, it takes no more work and effort to really run a $100,000 campaign than it does a $1,000 campaign. It's just a matter of turning the knobs and pulling the levers to figure out what's going to work and what doesn't, and then pumping budget and pumping uh, more dollars into, uh, into the campaigns once they're optimized. All right, Jake, well, while I've got you hot and talking right there, cannabis businesses have many regulations surrounding it, so can you share with us some of your thoughts on programmatic exchanges, publishers, and the suppliers? Yeah, I kind of already talked about well, I think you need to expand. No, I think you can no, expand on that. I think you answered it early. Okay. <laughs> all right, well, are, can you expand on it a little bit? Just some of the, because while there are some guidelines and stuff that we all feel like we can flirt with using cloaks and other things, but maybe there's some things that we don't need to flirt with that are actually definitive that we could work with. Yeah, we actually got a pretty good um, advertising guideline from Christian. He sent that over. Uh, he's done a lot of research on this. Um, he's got a nice guidebook. Uh, but it changes every day, really. I mean, we were running a campaign in Canada, and part of the legalization is they have created really aggressive um, advertising guidelines. You basically can only tell people where to get something, and that's it. Like, you're not allowed to have pictures, you can't have people, like, enjoying things. So, um, I don't know, because uh, it changes every day. I mean, you just have to stay on top of it. Cynthia, how does, how does data help improve marketing, PR, and advertising campaigns? Um, well, big data is the future of all of the above, PR marketing and advertising. To understand where to spend your money best, you want to understand your demographics, so consumer behavior. Go to 
POS platform, CRM, whoever has the data across social media, any one of these platforms, and look at who you're trying to target and what the best outlets to engage would be. So this way, when you develop your plan and execute on your strategy, you're not wasting money. And it's pretty much just uh, reiterating what, what the gentlemen are saying. So the best way to do it is uh, look at the data and evolve your campaign to what's working best, like they're saying. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Gary. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. You sure? I find a question that we don't all agree on, so yeah. we can argue about it. <laughs> well, if you're all aware of these, so making this nice and easy. Yeah. Chris, here's a good one. What, what can you share with us, or would you share with us your thoughts on the brand pyramid and business lifecycle differentiators? Oh, thank God that was asked. Um, <laughs> it, I, because if it wasn't, I was going to um, have to answer it anyway. The, it, we've talked a lot here about tactics, right? Like right. pretty much everything we've talked about thus far has been tactical delivery channels. Um, and we've sort of inverted the discussion, I think, because... I don't care what tactic you use. If you don't think through your brand, um, you can throw 500 bucks or 5 million bucks against it and it may be shit and it, it won't matter. Um, the, brand, the brand pyramid really needs to be the fundamental. You've got to figure out what are my product attributes? What are the rational attributes that people look at my product and think about? What are the emotional um, attributes that come out of that. Once I figured that out, uh, the next step is what's my brand personality going to be that's going to resonate with those folks? And then at the top, what is that unique differentiator that really is going to take all of that and make it real to my prospective customer? Cannabis brands right now are not doing a good job at thinking about that. I mean, if you look in a dispensary on the consumer side, <coughs> And you look at the packaging, yeah, there's some that pops, but it's all indica, sativa, it makes me happy, it makes me sleepy, and that's the extent of it. You talk to the bud tenders and the product differentiation doesn't come out very well. And that translates then, um, depending on the laws in each region, into the mobile advertising, into the digital spends, into the email and everything else. So you really have to think about that brand architecture first, and then everything else that we're talking about starts to make sense. If you don't, you're gonna fail. So, I mean, people will take your money, and you may sell some product, but you're never gonna be king of the hill, or queen of the hill. Yeah. Well, in all fairness, I think cannabis brands didn't really have too many options in the past, so we're just getting the data over the last couple of years that people can look at, but you're right. If people don't pay attention to these things, they're just going to continue to fail. Yeah, and I, yes and no. Like, it doesn't change the fact that even if you don't have the data, you still have to create and do your own research to establish the right kind of brand messaging for your product. Um, I see a lot of people justifying a lack of planning and thought. Um, by saying, well, I can't do X or I can't do Y. So we just have to like cut the cord and quit making excuses and build the brand the right way. Yeah, and I think, I think to, that's a perfect point. I, I think that because of the regulations that seem to be uh, stumping everybody's brand growth, uh, people have kind of taken a shortcut, right? So of course we went directly to the tactical in this conversation, right? It is actually a great uh, example of what happens in the marketplace. Because we believe we can't advertise out in the real world, uh, we just go directly to performance and delivery, performance and delivery, and if it's gonna work, then we try it again. I agree 100%, and I think there's there's some, some real world things and mature market things that we t I talked about earlier on a panel about learning from other markets, right? Shortening your learning curve. Advertising is to tell you that the cup is here. Marketing is to tell you why to put water in the with the cup, right? And we have to do that in, in uh, with cannabis brands as well. Um, and there's a lot of things that most advertising is self-regulated. And so we talk about these regulations that are stopping us from doing advertising. And a lot of those regulations don't actually exist except for in what we perceive because nobody has gone through the process of reading all of the guidelines and they are guidelines, 
right? So we're going to have to take some, some risk, right? We're going to have to use data, right? We're going to, as, as you just said, create a brand, create a message, test that message, use the data to tell you how that message is doing. And if you get blocked from Google for using the word marijuana in this day and age, I'm sorry, but you deserve to get blocked from Google because we've been telling you for four years you can't fucking use the word marijuana in Google, right? So if you're doing that today, you deserve to get blocked, right? Although adopt, you know, adapt to the market that you're working in and stop trying to hide from it and just kind of work with it. <clears throat> just a side note on that, my ads mentioning marijuana right now are actually getting through. I got blocked with the word hemp the other day. Uh, yeah, so listen. it just, you have to just keep It's asking, absolutely right? hit or miss. And most of it's because nerds like us built the damn algorithms that are, that are trying to recognize real words, right? And sometimes they don't work. Yep. When yeah. you say nerds like us, like oh, okay. I just, I wasn't sure who, uh, uh, us, uh, okay. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> Jake and I. That's why we wouldn't sit next to each other. <laughs> yeah, geospatial guy over here. That's right. Yeah, the other thing is with your when you're doing a brand, when you're building a brand, understand who your consumer is and then advertise to them, right? So don't try and be everything to everyone and, and because you're just wasting your time, right? The you have the customer from like Octavia Wellness is not the same person that buys the brass knuckle vape pen. Right? You're gonna find them in different places and you should know who you're trying to reach. In companies like Media Gel, Traffic Roots, right? The, the, these companies can give you where those audiences are. But if you don't know how to talk, and this is our point, I'll stop, we'll stop kicking the dead horse. But if you don't know how to talk to the audience in the first place, it doesn't matter where they are. And also have good creative. Because if you spend all that time and effort to get to someone, and then you give them something that looks dumb, then you've wasted all that time and money too. Yeah. That's a good point. Christian, can you give us some ad, some examples of some uh, different campaigns that have run on your on uh, traffic routes, like some of the brands, how they worked out? No. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it, I, think, it, I think it's kind of second, that's exactly to what you said. Creatives are big. And, and you have to test creatives. Obviously, we say test, test, test everything. But, you know, the honest truth is if you show your ad to 10 people and they say it sucks, probably shouldn't run it. Uh, that's honest truth. I mean, I, I see a lot of ads coming through our platform, um, and, and sometimes I'm very eager, and I have called them up, be like, you know what? Um, this isn't going to work, because it's just it doesn't convey a message. The reason of, a, of an ad is you have a really short period of time to get somebody's interest. You don't want to tell a story. You really just want to have them say, oh, that looks interesting, or I want to learn more about it. Click, and then you sell them. And I think understanding that process is important. The creative aspect is, it's tough, because you have to be concise, you have to get your message across, and it has to be a good image. And then you have to give enough information to that customer to make an educated decision about the product. And, and that sales flow, I think, is, is one of the things that um, the cannabis industry is kind of lacking. It's called the sales funnel, whether you're collecting leads or whatever that is. Uh, and I can't emphasize how important that is to, to do it right. Yeah, and I would add making those unique differentiators, right? And making sure that those words that you use, it can be beautiful and all 10 of those people may love it. But if it looks like this, something that a competitor just delivered last week, it's still not going to work. Yeah. Less is more sometimes, you're right. Gary, can you discuss big ad tech staying out of the cannabis space right now and what that means from an opportunity standpoint for a closed loop market? Yeah, perfect. So, uh, you know, as I just, as we've been talking about, right, there are, each one of the ad platforms has their own regulation. Uh, you know, obviously with a, with a product like, like cannabis, uh, you know, the federal government has regulations. So, Yahoo, Facebook, Microsoft, they're staying away from, from the market, right? And they're, and they're shutting some people down and not shutting other people down, but the, the message from them is they're not coming into the market, which gives companies like Traffic Roots and Media Gel and New Frontier Data the opportunity to bring in a closed loop advertising at, a, at an enormous scale, right? So in a completely closed loop market that has hundreds of millions of impressions available to it, 
right? And it's in, that's important for the cannabis, for the cannabis products. But it's also don't forget that there are 500 companies standing on the sidelines waiting to get to the 27 million cannabis consumers that all of us represent, and they they need to be able to come in and be protected, right? They need to be able to come in and ensure that their brand isn't ruined because. Nike is a great example of this, right? And this is the example I give sometimes when we talk, you know, at, at, at New Frontier Data, or, to, or actually you and I talked about this, uh, Jake, just a couple weeks ago. You know, Nike makes a 420 sneaker every year. Nike loses its ass on the 420 sneaker every year because they can't advertise that they just spent $10 million making the sneaker and putting it in the market. Now, some people know about it, some people don't, right? The festivals and things like that. Well, if we could go to my, as if we, right, if we could go to Nike as a marketplace and say we have the tech, we have the ad platform, we have the hyperlocation capabilities, and we have the messaging capability to bring you into the market, introduce you to 27 million consumers, and not ruin your brand with the rest of the world, they would probably give us a little bit of money. Yeah. Right? And at this point in the size of our market, a, a tech platform like that, right, or a, a tech marketplace like that, Nike throws $10 million out to do a test, right? You know, Jake just said, don't spend 500 bucks. Nike throws $10 million out to do a test. We could do a lot with $10 million in this marketplace. I think we should call Phil Knight, like, maybe let's end this whole thing. <laughs> anybody have Phil Knight's number? Yeah, anybody have Phil's number? Okay. That was awesome. Um, I'm going to take some questions from the audience unless you want to add. Yeah. Like to say one last Perfect, thing. please. So, as the industry has matured, there are options within our own publications to where like MJ Biz Daily or Green Market Report or even still High Times if that's the audience that you're going after. The type of syndication that they have, if you advertise with them, you should be able to reach a large audience. So if all else fails, once you figure out the messaging, figure out who you're targeting, you can always advertise straight through those publications, and that's safe. We don't have any rules. I don't know about you, but no. So if you're a brand in the industry, go straight for the publications that have no limitations. I think that's safest. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, I'm going to take some questions from the audience, and we might drop a few little pieces of advice. Go ahead. What's your question? Sure, and a lot of that I think has to do with, you know, for one, I don't, I'm not sure what the question was, it was more of a statement, but... Well, by everyone, not up here, but as far as the, 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 the cannabis marketplace itself, there, there's not a lot of ad expertise that are in the can, that's in the cannabis space right now to appreciate what's offered and what is available and how to do it, much less carving out a budget and dedicating it to that sort of effort. At the same time, a lot of cannabis brands and businesses for a long time didn't, not only could they not really advertise, but they didn't have to. I mean, if you had pot, you were gonna, it wasn't hard to sell it, especially in a store. And if you had a relatively decently packaged brand, it was going to be easier to sell than the Rice Krispie treat in the, in the you know, cellophane wrapped up. So it wasn't hard. They didn't have to advertise. You know, good brands or average brands just sold because it was pot and it got people high, so it wasn't difficult. Whereas now, sorry, I know you're jumping in. Whereas now what we're saying is you can and you actually need to consider, you know, making it a priority to dedicate budget and effort and resources towards it. And there are ways to do it, but I don't think there's enough, uh, the intelligence uh, from a an advertising perspective in the cannabis space is not there yet to appreciate what's, uh, what's available to them. But I'll, you want to jump in, Gary? Sorry. I also, also I think we have to remember that especially at the dispensary level uh, and the local cannabis producer level, they're not allowed to write off 
most of their marketing for tax purposes. So they're, they're actually talking about, they're talking about taking money off their bottom line. And so that's a different conversation when you're talking to somebody who has to literally take money out of their pocket to do the advertising. And I think that companies, again, like Traffic Roots, Media Gel, uh, New Frontier Data, our job as leaders in the industry is to bring out technology, to bring out technology and, um, and services that help reduce the cost of the, the interaction and the cost of the engagement. And I think, you know, and sometimes you do it for free once in a while. You, you help them out and you show them the performance of what you can do and then they'll probably spend money. But most of these companies are not allowed to, to, to write off that cost. Go ahead, right. Up front. So is your question how to build trust? Or I think it's education. Advertising, education, telling people why they shouldn't. Um, because you're right, it's always cheaper to say, hey, well, I'm just gonna go buy it elsewhere instead of a licensed dispensary, which would cost whatever X more. But um, it's, it's maturity of the industry, it's education on why you should. Well, not necessarily. So, I mean, it's just that uh, it's still, we're still in that transitional phase where not too long ago, you were buying it from the guy in the corner. We, like, we have a shop in Hollywood that's seen 70 patients a day, while two black guards have seen 500,000 patients. How do we make it more Media. Valuable? Lower the taxes, too. <laughs> yeah. Lower the taxes. Well, yeah. I honestly think media is the way to go. Um, that's the quickest way to reach a broad audience and to educate them through that source. Uh, to get your message out there and just tell them, here's the safer, here's the organic, here's this, that, this is tested versus this or that, and just put it in a mainstream publication. You're in LA, LA Weekly, LA Times. LA Weekly is probably a little bit easier to get to, um, but I would use the media for that. That's your quickest path. Yeah, a good example <laughs> is who follows a gluten-free diet? And who knew what the hell was gluten-free five years ago or 10 years ago? It, it, it's, it, it's marketing. You got, you know, us as consumers got educated on what gluten-free meant and what that meant for our bodies. And it's, that is based on marketing and it's based on education. Now, because of that, a lot of the brands, the restaurants and everything, they brand themselves as gluten-free. Right. And, and, and once again, it was, a, it was a, a dual effect on the marketing aspect where first you educate and then you brand yourself as gluten-free. So, and th to that example, it's, it's like, don't buy from the street guy because he probably has pesticides. And then the opposite, eventually, once you make that transition, it's like, hey, by the way, this is certified pesticide-free. And it's the exact same concept as like gluten-free. To the yeah, education, I, go ahead, Jay. Yeah, I think yeah. you need to educate consumers to value trust, right? Which is kind of your original question about the trust thing. They don't value that right now because they don't understand why they need to. Right? So that's, I think, what solves that. That's exactly right. That's a good question. Go ahead. You want to show your creatives? You want me to take a look at them? There you go. There's your answer. 
Everybody's visual. Everybody's visual. That's the first point of contact. If it's not attractive, people aren't going to click on it. Yeah. They're not going to engage with it. That's and the first thing you need to focus on. So, but I could, yeah. Yeah. The, Absolutely. You should be getting a three to like three to one return. If you're if you're advertising a social gathering and you're using paid media to advertise socializing, maybe you think about doing social media, right? Because that's also more all or all our marketing is organic to the person who's listening to it, right, or hearing it or engaging with it, right? So if you're asking people to come socialize, but you're putting up a billboard to do it, that might not work so well. Right? Because it's a lot of money, and a lot of people are going to see it, and most of those people don't want to socialize with you, right? So get on your social media and do some paid advertising and some, and some audience building and targeting from your social media because they're in the mood to socialize when they're engaging with your brand. Yeah, remember, they're going to see this thing for about three seconds, and therefore things like video perform a whole lot better, as we talked about earlier, for those types of reasons. So if you really want to try to increase that a little bit, recognize you got three seconds. You need to have some great creative and take it to the level of video, and you probably got a 75% chance, just based on some of this. But Gary made a great point about what you're doing and getting to it through the, the right channels. Go ahead, Jake. The other thing that happens, especially if you're going to do a, a smaller buy like that, um, there's just rampant fraud in digital advertising, <laughs> right? There's, there's huge server farms that are just waiting to take your money. So um, you need to be very specific about how you're targeting audiences. You, you will reduce your reach by doing that, but if you're not, uh, if you don't have like a whole team of like anti-fraud people watching this stuff, the easiest way to do it is to like pick very specific places where you can trust those publications and then run media there. Content. Yeah. Engage content. Like you have to build content with your audience. Um, you build trust. You build engagement. So when you do have that event, everybody's already listening. You literally have to just make a post. Like, hey, come join us. Be careful who you're targeting. Once again, find out who it is you're trying to reach, who's most likely to come to your event, and then where they frequent on whatever platforms you feel are most beneficial. But definitely look at your demographic, look at time of day, and be strategic about how you utilize you know, the money. Oh yeah, time of day. That's the thing a lot of people don't think about. You start running an ad. You probably don't want to run your ad 24 hours a day, which is the default setting. So there's a tip. Any other questions? You got a question? Go for it. Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, so I'm sure. It go ahead, on Chris. The product. If it's THC based, you can't really do much with it. You can direct somebody to buy it. But if it's a CBD product, you could definitely do conversion tracking. And then you do get a, a true ROI based on your clicks and your revenue and you know, what you put in. So, for those who may or may not know, conversion tracking is this little piece of code that you can add to like a thank you page when somebody buys something. And when somebody buys, that client is being tracked, and this just sounds scary, but this is the way it is, from site to click to the page to the shopping cart all the way down to the purchase. So when a thank you page comes up, that piece of code basically sends a signal and says, hey, you got a sale. So real time, then you can actually track how much money you're spending, how many, what's your conversion ratio, and then see how many sales or what's your ROI from it. And yeah, there's... there's I mean, that's, that's, yeah, you're, that's, you can't. It's hard. You, you can, and it depends on your, on your campaign, yeah. too, because if, if your approach, if you're doing geotargeting and saying, hey, by the way, this product is here, then you could definitely refer them to that store. Correct. And, If Ease lets you put a picture on their website, yes. The term conversion pixel is another education issue that we're working on. Um, in general, um, a lot of systems are just not that sophisticated right now. Or you deal with issues where um, people are still very protective 
of their data. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you say you want to put something on their site or integrate with their POS system, you, the default answer is no, I'm not gonna give you access to that. Um, that needs to change because that's the only way that we're gonna be able to optimize. But that's kind of what we're dealing with now. Um, we do have one thing that we can do yeah. with the Geo <laughs> stuff where we can, um, if we serve a, uh, ads to an audience on a mobile phone, if it's, uh, we can put them into an observed audience and then we can look at a location to see that they've come into that location later, right? So you run an ad for five weeks and then you watch the retail location of where you're trying to get them to go and you can do some conversion tracking that way. Um, and that runs passively in the background because everyone here has many apps on their phone and those apps are collecting your data um, and they're sending it to advertisers. You just scared the shit out of half yeah. the, half the <laughs> advertisers. I was, was going to try to stay away from the it, privacy freakout thing, things, but now here we are. One other thing, and, uh, you know, as it's been said, the, the, the market is maturing, right? So there are POS systems out there now that are doing, that, that will provide you that information, right? Uh, and some of the older ones, they'll get there over the next year or so. But some of the newer ones, especially the web-based ones with, with you know, less API integration and things like that, they will, they will absolutely, if they think your product, if, you, if they think you're a, an honest broker and you have a good product that's going to help their clients and their dispensaries, they'll absolutely let you. It's, it's all timing. And, and then if you can get pretty specific with the information you can find out these days with, through the POS systems, the CRM mm -hmm. systems, you can find out, you know, how much money people are spending, how often they're going into the stores, what their age frame is and take that, figure out your consumer behavior, and then start targeting. But do the research first, create a good brand. Look at yep. the numbers, then spend. Can I, you, guys, you guys just really want to scare the hell out of these guys <laughs> early tonight. I want to comment the on, is there. Get over it. on marketing ethics real quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I think, you know, when you look at the tech that we've got these days, whether it's in mainstream marketing or cannabis, um, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time building some very robust tech on people that attend our shows and understanding what they want so that we deliver what our audience is looking for. But there's some things that we choose not to track, right? We could, but we don't turn that on. Because, and it might make us incrementally two or three percent better, and I could certainly prove an ROI. But there's, there's a lot of things in life, right, that you can do, but maybe you shouldn't because you want to be able to sit up in front of an audience like this <laughs> and tell a story about the fact that there is ethics in marketing and part of delivering a professional product and part of delivering what the audience wants is respecting them and respecting their privacy. So um, I'm all for data. I'm a huge supporter of using it in marketing because it makes us all better but to all of this discussion, yeah, I can geo-target somebody to their handset ID, which essentially means I can market to a group of one, but I don't need to, and so I'm not going to. I actually think, I think that uh, ethics obviously are an important part, but I think what you're talking about is actually a really important distinction for the conversation. You're a, a, a media publication, right, and, and your ads, while we engage with those ads in, in the shows and the media that you produce, uh, you know, during business hours or whenever, but for a particular purpose. I think what Jake was talking about, we laugh about scaring the shit out of people, but what Jake was talking about, back to the, the previous point, where these dispensaries need to know, right? They don't need to know that you did or Gary did, right? But they do need to know 30 people right, hovered in that dispensary. Sure, they need to know 30 so people in basic buying trends. They, exactly. they don't they necessarily buying, need, I don't to, need know to know that, know that John, it was yeah, John. Yeah. John Smith or whomever. And that's where the ethics come in. But right. the larger right. data is valuable and you should use it to your advantage so that you don't lose as much money when you go after advertising, marketing, branding, whatever, but you'd be, it would be irresponsible not to take advantage of what's available. Exactly. Sure, yeah. And, it, Go ahead, Jerry said what he said earlier, the industry is largely self-regulating and there are standards that people have for audiences. Like you can't do an audience of one with these tools, right? You, you have to have thousands of people in them. And, well, most of them anyway. Um, uh, if you're gonna build an audience and like sell an audience in a data marketplace, you can't, it, it has to be large enough that that group of people is protected as an aggregate data point and not individuals. Yeah, right. 
that is the way yeah. you should do it. But probably, if probably. a bad operator could do a single yeah, I mean, person. If, like, so uh, Facebook is easy to do this with, right? You can upload an audience. I think their number is 500 or 1,000. There is a number where they just won't let you do it. If it's, you try to upload like one person's identifier, you can't advertise to them on Facebook. For me, though, I, I'm I thinking more like Maybe ages 31 to 45, yeah, male, sure. making this much money with this much education. I understand <laughs> that that's more appropriate for my brand, but I agree 100%, 110% that out. ethics are extremely important in the day of it data. So yes, don't try to be creepy about it. 